Hi, thanks to Jen Person and uh, Defend Digital for inviting me to share some thoughts about uh, digital futures, and um, particularly for further education and skills. I'm grateful for that. I spent a lifetime working in further and adult education and also some time in the uh, uh, technology industry as an education advisor for Toshiba Northern Europe. Uh, before uh, we start going forward, I just need to take you backwards a little bit because one of the fundamental problems that we've got is that uh, our education and training system is predicated on the set of design principles that came out of a bygone era. They came out of uh, the industri post-industrial revolution era when our uh, industries were dominated by particular industries uh, that, were, that were heavy. Uh, steel, shipbuilding, coal, textiles, manufacturing. And of course the design principles for the learning that went along with those reflected the design principles of those industries. So my thesis and something that I've been banging on about for nearly 20 years is something of a, a bittersweet irony that uh, a, a virus should come along and in three or four weeks uh, achieve more than I've managed to do in 20 years trying to persuade policymakers and principals and head teachers and politicians of the value of investing in digital technology to help with teaching, learning and assessment. So my first point is the design principles upon which our education and training system are predicated are now no longer fit for purpose in what uh, increasingly is a digital age. And because of that, uh, we are unable really to take advantage of the full potential of digital technology. And the worst case scenario, uh, as I see it, as we go back after COVID, is that what we do, and I have to say uh, what some of the examples we've seen in the last three or four weeks, some of the panic examples, I would say Oak National, for example, is what we're trying to do is to force uh, new technology into old ways of working. And this metaphor comes out of an actual real example of uh, the London manure, uh, horse manure crisis. And if you're really interested in that as a metaphor, Google it and find out uh, what all that was about. But so what we really need is a paradigm shift. Instead of trying to force uh, new technology into old ways of working, i.e putting talking head teacher videos on, onto uh, recordings and then uh, publishing them and um, uh, putting them out as programs. Because really all that's doing is uh, reinforcing the idea that the content is the most important thing and that teaching, that we fail to distinguish the difference between online schooling, online teaching and online learning. And so um, one of the quotes that Jen picked up on an article I wrote in, uh, I think it was either SecEd or Times Ed, Times Ed, uh, was this quote from Diana Lorillard, which came up really as part of the Ministerial Further Education Learning Technologies Action Group work we did about five years ago, which led to the, the Feltag report, which I'll come to a little bit later. But basically Diana's point, and I think there's a lot of validity in this, <coughs> And as a judge of the BET Awards and the TES FE Awards and uh, uh, e-assessment awards, the Learning Reimagined Awards, as I get to my age, judging and being able to access information and really be inspired by what's happening in our schools and colleges on the ground, uh, teachers and learners using technology in a really innovative way. Some of the wonderful examples I've seen in colleges, land-based colleges, specialist colleges, that teachers are doing this and innovating despite the system. Because as Diana says, the drivers of the education system, uh, the way that we assess, the way that we design the curriculum, the way that our inspection and quality assurance programs go, the way that our funding flows, and particularly the way that our promotion criteria are based, they have not changed significantly and sufficiently to allow us to make the best use of uh, education technology so really to some extent whatever changes are taking place are taking place despite the system so unless we push back against some of these issues for example uh, on assessment um, the e-assessment association do some fantastic work but predominantly we are still dominated by end tests and particularly under this government 
um, N test, which tests knowledge, um, and particularly still using uh, A4 paper and pens when my uh, member of my family, for example, who has Asperger's, uh, didn't use a pen and paper for three or four years, particularly when he was at university. But when he came to do his end, final endpoint assessments, uh, had to spend three hours using a pen and writing on A4 uh, sides of paper. Now that's like uh, learning to drive in a Formula One car and then being asked to ride a horse for your assessments. In terms of curriculum design, I think we still are designing uh, 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 curriculum that presupposes that in order for learning to take place, you have to have a set number of people in a set room at a set time with a set person. And that, that then creates a learning environment. Well, that may be one way, but there are, of course, what we've learned about with the COVID situation is that learning can take place in lots of different environments using lots of different technologies. And we don't have to all be in the same room at the same time at the same place doing the same stuff. The inspection and quality issue is a massive issue. One of the recommendations of the Feltag report was that Ofsted uh, were asked, required by the minister, to look at their common inspection framework and to see how they could uh, adjust their inspection framework to identify examples of good practice and uh, therefore encourage the use of technology enhanced learning. Uh, unfortunately, Ofsted were reluctant to do that and to this day still have not yet trained their inspectors to be able to identify and make judgments about what quality online learning looks like. I think funding is another massive issue that uh, with, with the funding system that we have, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't reward innovation, it doesn't reward uh, way, different ways of doing things and it tends to reward conformity. Uh, and reward uh, learning with people present in a particular place at a particular time. I mean, just think about registers and uh, you know uh, classrooms and registrations and stuff like that, as opposed to learning presence is somebody in uh, engaged with learning, wherever that is and, and, and wherever it's taking place. So uh, all those things, funding and, and the promotion criteria, I mean, how many uh, assistant principals, how many principals, there are, there are increasingly numbers, but traditionally the people who get promoted are the people who are hitting all the criteria, which are linked to those following, those previous things I mentioned, assessment, curriculum, inspection, quality. So because of all those claustrophobic controlling issues, um, innovation within uh, teaching and learning in further education has been really difficult uh, to uh, change. Having said that, there are some fantastic uh, things going on. Uh, I mean, the, there are some uh, colleges, I mean, the, the eight colleges that were shortlisted, that I shortlisted for the TES FE awards, really some fantastic uh, stuff going on on the ground. But as I say, it's despite the system, not because of the system. But let's be clear, um, and I know this, I've written extensively about the, the DFE and the EdTech strategy, or rather not the EdTech strategy. And I think, you know, it's a real frustration that we can't wait for the DFE uh, or, um, you know, the government to, to intervene in this area because they're always so far behind the curve. Even if you look at what's happening now, uh, we're now getting laptops given out to children on free school meals when now we've got the Oak National Academy but all of that is way behind what's been happening on the ground for lots of people for lots of time but before we go any further let's just get one thing really very clear uh, there is very little evidence of any causal link between technology and improved learning outcomes and if you really want to know how not to do it uh, just google uh, Apple Pearson Los Angeles and disaster throwing technology uh, uh, and as uh, we heard at the Alt National Conference from Tracy McMillan Cotton, uh, context is the really important issue. It's not about content, it's about context. And throwing technology without consideration, throwing technology at problems without consideration of context, I'm afraid it's just going to accentuate disadvantage and it's not going to uh, help narrow the uh, achievement gap. So let's be clear. There is no causal link. However, 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 
there is some evidence, some strong evidence that there is a correlation uh, between those uh, schools, colleges, organizations that use, and learners that use digital technology effectively and improve learning outcomes. And this is Steve Higgins, Durham University um, study from some years ago. There's, in, there's more research knocking about. And in fact, recently the uh, Education Endowment Foundation built upon a meta study that was done in America about 10 years ago. And of course, uh, what it demonstrates is that if you're looking in comparisons between online, face-to-face -face, and blended learning, every, every meta-analysis demonstrates that blended learning beats online, blended learning beats face-to-face. -face. So it's not a case of either technology or, you know, and some of the, some of the people that have been exploiting that of late by writing books called Tech Versus Teachers or have taken a polarised view to say it's either online or face-to-face, -face, are just wrong. That blended learning is emerging as the, the combination of using some face-to-face, -face, some online, and some tutorial support. So let, let me just quickly go through what the Feltag themes were, because I think these are still relevant, uh, and I'm conscious of the time that uh, I've, I've been given to, to finish this. Um, these things still, do we have the vision and the understanding of where technology is going. Are we using, are the learners using their own technology? Are we engaging with employers and using the technology that employers are using? Is the regulation of funding, and I've already discussed that about Ofsted and Ofqual and uh, the Skills Funding Agency, are they helping or hindering how we use technology? My view is at the moment they're hindering it. Do we have the right investment and in capital infrastructure? And probably the last one, number six, more important than anything else, do we have the workforce capacity, capability, and confidence in using technology to really fully exploit technology to its full benefits? So it's not really about the technology in my view. Uh, it's, it's all about uh, different ways of thinking. And we need to break away from uh, the old paradigm of thinking, teaching and learning is about a group of people coming together at a certain number of time, time in a certain place with a teacher and we need to break away from that and then redesign our learning and curriculum uh, in order to support learning using the most effective technology that we can. So finally, I think COVID has shown us that the reality uh, and the circumstances, rationale and representation for learning have changed. And the only thing we can do is to confront it. And I'm grateful uh, that uh, Jen's given me this opportunity and Defend Digital have given me this opportunity of sharing this with you. So thanks very much. You can follow me on Twitter and I hope you find that uh, helpful. Thank you.